Thank you, Ian. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, that's good to hear. I, I got that. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, I wanted to start by saying what perfect weather to start talking about rain gardens. And actually, what better person to tell us about rain gardens than Deborah Jones? So I first heard about uh, Deborah's trail break Blazing, sorry, I have a problem with my mouth, volunteer collaboration uh, a few years ago. She collab has been collaborating with the city of Delta. And together they've installed well over 30 school and community rain gardens now. And this program has been expanded beyond Delta. And now probably every lower mainland municipality has a rain garden program of some sort. Deborah is a member one of one of our sister groups, the Delta Naturalists. And she has volunteered with Delta's Cougar Creek Streamkeepers for almost two decades. Tonight, Deborah is wearing her Streamkeepers hat, and the focus of her presentation is the value of rain gardens to salmon. And I know there's a lot of salmon, a uh, number of salmon folks on this call. So please join me in welcoming Deborah Jones. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thanks so much for having me. You make it sound as if I, you know, started rain garden programs, but believe me, they were around before <laughs> before it began. But that, well, that was good. That sounded great. <laughs> you yes, sound uh, very good. <laughs> we have thirty of them in um, in North Delta now, and with a uh, youth group called um, Be the Change, or a youth uh, facilitating group called uh, Be the Change Earth Alliance. Um, we're branching out now. Um, Vancouver, Richmond, and soon Ladner, which is part of Delta, but a low-lying part of Delta. Um, so yeah, branching out a little farther. Shall I share my screen now and without further ado, get to this PowerPoint? Let's go ahead. That would, that would be great. Okay, share screen. Let's see. Uh, what happened to slideshow where's my slideshow <laughs> no we it's looking good deborah we just you know just there's need... there should be a um function that says slideshow and then it gives me the full screen yep just yeah. take your time uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it here Let's if you hit see. function five pardon me if you hit the function p5 function key five okay well, on, on your keyboard yeah let's see that's worked Oh, that worked great. Yep. Okay. I did it. I think I just saw Jane Shoemaker join. I don't, Jane, are you the Jane from folk dancing many, many years ago? That was you. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Nice to sort of see you, Jane, after so long. Well, it seems folk dancing. And, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. And Ron Stoodings and Jane. Wow, this is old this home is week. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Uh Another talent of Jane Shoemaker we didn't know about. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, it's pretty, I have a pretty dense um, um, slideshow here, but lots and lots of pictures. Um, and I'd like to begin with just a few extraneous slides saying how I became a rain gardener. Um, it all started in 1999 with this article with the uh, bold headline in the Vancouver Sun by um, UBC professor P uh, Patrick Condon, uh, beware the killer pavement. This article absolutely changed how I looked at landscapes. I had been an urban studies major as an undergrad. Um, I am married to a geographer. I mean, I thought I was sort of aware of landscapes, but this really did change how I saw landscapes and you'll you'll learn about that as we go along. Um, I'd like to show you just kind of roughly where I am. North Delta is down here, this red circle. Looks pretty big when I circle it on the map, but when I come to Coquitlam or the Tri-Cities, it seems so vast up in your neck of the woods. You have so many streams and um, so many streets and boulevards and towers and you know North Delta seems like kind of the backwoods. Maybe some of you should be giving me the workshop. Um, we do have one major salmon stream, which is this one here, Cougar Creek, which goes out into the Fraser River. So our salmon, returning salmon come up that route. And this past year we had um, 
277 is our best estimate of how many returns we had almost entirely coho, wild coho. So that is really nice. And here's um, a bigger view of our best creek. There are some creeks as well. Uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with this map. The red creeks are the dead creeks, usually buried in a combined sewer somewhere. The blue creeks are the living creeks. And of course, the Tri-Cities have tons of living creeks. And North Delta has Cougar Creek and its tributary Blake. And along the north um, end of North Delta up here, South Shore, the Fraser River, um, there are other salmon streams as well. So here's a blow up of our creek. And um, to the right of Scott Road is Surrey. So we're active somewhat in Surrey, but most of our stream keeper group is active throughout North Delta. We're very fortunate that there aren't many um, culverts um, along the whole route of the creek. Um, it goes through the Delta Nature Reserve. So that is a, a big plus. So now to the point, bring gardens for salmon. We'll look at three things. First, what do rain gardens, what do gardens of any kind have to do with salmon? And um, I hope that um, um, you'll come away understanding all that. And many of you probably understand that already. Uh, so this might be a review for, for you, bear with me. Uh, part two, we'll look at the collaboration that Victoria mentioned between uh, stream keepers in the city of Delta. And uh, then we'll look at possibilities for creating your own rain gardens. There are some very easy things that you can do. So part one, what do gardens have to do with salmon? And again, forgive me if this is great repetition for some of you. Water is life. We know that we are literally made of water. All life is made mostly of water. And at any given time, less than 1% of Earth's water is accessible fresh water. And um, we do have more water, fresh water in ice caps and glaciers, but of course those are melting fast into the salt chuck. So really the amount of fresh water is amazingly small. It's incredible that that tiny percentage can sustain all of us terrestrial creatures and freshwater creatures, and that includes us. So if you go back to oh, secondary school, you no doubt learned about the water cycle and how it's entirely solar driven. The sun evaporates water from the oceans, leaving behind the minerals and salts. Uh, water goes over the land, um, eventually cools, fall, the moisture falls as precipitation, rain, snow, hail, and so on. And then it works its way gradually back out to the ocean. So what we're going to be focusing on is what happens during this time on the land when we're, water is working its way back to the ocean. So here's how um, natural landscapes um, manage precipitation. Um, here's a forest, the greatest managers of precipitation. We have our rainfall. A lot of that rainfall gets caught up in the trees, never even reaches the ground and it evaporates back out to the atmosphere. And that actually becomes a source of moisture for uh, clouds to kind of leapfrog their way to the interior. So um, this is a bit theoretical, but totally plausible. If you deforest your coastal areas, you are adding, you are adding to the risk of interior drought because you are taking away this wonderful source of moisture that can evaporate and move farther inland. It's um, estimated that uh, water rain that falls inland, far inland, can have gone through this um, precipitation and evaporation cycle as many as six times before it finally falls in an inland and more arid area. So water that does reach the ground, of course, um, got a lot of thirsty plants there, so they take up water. And just like us, they're always breathing out water. They're transpiring water. So evapotranspiration is the amount of water that goes back out into the atmosphere from these combined um, features of water never reaching the ground and water being absorbed by, by plants, especially trees, and being breathed out. What does go into the ground gradually seeps its way to a low-lying area, which would be a creek or a 
some other water body, lake, uh, shoreline, whatever. So that's nature's stormwater management system. So it, essentially in nature, the landscape is acting like this enormous sponge. It's soaking up precipitation, evaporating a lot of it, but soaking up a lot of it, storing it in the ground as groundwater. And it's gradually releasing any excess that organisms don't absorb um, into these low lying bodies of water and ultimately back to the ocean. So as that groundwater is seeping through the soil, uh, it's providing this great supply of water for everything. This is one of our skunk cabbage um, mini meadows in um, Cougar Canyon. And here it is later on in the year. And finally, that water seeps into our creeks and it's filtered. It's amazingly filtered, and that's why we have these clear creeks, which of course, and it's cool as well from having gone underground. Uh, so cool and clear, just what salmon need. So when we start developing, we significantly reduce the land's ability to absorb water. And that's where that headline, Beware the Killer Pavement, came from. We start off with forest. Everything is, is a, an asset. We've got this 50% or so of evapotranspiration. It's an asset. It's great for creating new clouds that blow farther inland and keep inland areas hydrated. We've got our shallow groundwater and we've got our deeper groundwater. Even when we just get pasture, we're starting to get this thin red line, which is water that can't soak into the ground. The ground has been compacted. The forest cover has been removed. Um, the, the soil is not as spongy as it was. Maybe there are buildings associated with the farm and so on. So we begin to get this, this water that doesn't soak in. Suburban, city, these processes are just increased more and more. I would say that Delta and Tri-Cities looking at, you know, at the landscape, we're kind of in between this massive air, um, water, amounts of water that can't be absorbed in a full-blown city, and the suburban that we were not so long ago, where there was still a lot of absorption, a lot of evapotranspiration, and not a whole lot of this stuff, which is runoff water that just can't be absorbed. Whereas Vancouver, you look downtown Vancouver and so on, all you have is a reduced amount of evapotranspiration, which by the way, also has a huge cooling influence. It's like an air conditioner, like stepping out of the shower, uh, you feel cool because of that evaporation. So cities this is part of the heat island effect. Cities have lost this great amount of evapotranspiration and they have this huge amount of water that can't soak into the ground. So here's what it looks like on uh, Google. I love the historical function on Google. Here we are um, above Westwood Plateau, Burke Mountain, Coquitlam and so on. And this would be 1985. I'm gonna flip back and forth a couple of times and 2022. So as we develop, we're replacing this sponge. If you kind of zero in on just one particular area and look at it, and see what's happened and back again. So we're re replacing the sponge with all these roofs and pavements that are impervious. So what do we do with all this storm water runoff? It's a lot of it. Well, as you know, we install drains. We install drains everywhere. You see them in all streets, everywhere you go, drains in parking lots drains from rooftops, connecting down underground into, the, um, into your city's storm, storm drain system, drains everywhere. And whether they're marked with a fish or not, now I used to ask this before I became a stream keeper in 2004, I'd ask, well, hey, the drains that aren't marked with a fish, do those go to a, 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 a you know, sewage treatment facility? No, it's just there aren't enough stream keepers to mark the drains or enough school children. So virtually all of these drains connect to a network of underground pipes that empty into fish habitat somewhere. It could be a creek, a river, a lake, a shoreline. So you can understand how people got into doing it this way. I mean, it wasn't such a bad idea when our development was very um, sparse. We had large gardens, 
um, these kind of unpaved road shoulders were acceptable to people and those could soak up water. There were a lot of ditches and swales and so on. There was lots of opportunity for that um, natural process to happen. But our newer development standards minimize that infiltration, even when we have plenty of space for it. We want this tidy look with the curbs and the gutters and the drains and so on. That's the standard nowadays. And as I've noticed it more in North Delta, actually, than I noticed it driving around in Coquitlam the other day, but lots and lots less space, humongous houses or dense housing. This is from, uh, I think it was Coquitlam or Fort Coquitlam, Coquitlam probably. Um, yeah, very dense housing. This is down by Lions Park in Poco. And we're sprawling these landscapes, not only horizontally, but also vertically deep into the ground, whether it's a single family house with a basement, and we have tons of those here now in North Delta. Um, or parkades underground, we're excavating and trucking away that sponge, our, our free water storage and filtration system. So where does the water go? Well, more and more of it goes into the pipes. We, and that sheer volume of water going into the pipes can create a lot of problems. I'm sure that White Rock um, has now fixed this gusher problem, but this is um, the... Um, inability of sewers, the inadequacy of old storm sewers to deal with new volumes of stormwater runoff is what often leads to urban flooding, as in this case where a geyser of water just kind of bubbled up out of the drains because the drains simply are too small. So replacing all these drains with larger drains is a big taxpayer burden. From those pipes, that water flows into the creeks. Um, this is one of our outfalls into Cougar Creek. And once in the creek, well, that glut of stormwater causes a lot of erosion. Um, this particular bank of Cougar Canyon has a house above it. Houses were allowed to get really too close for safety. Um, but um, yeah, the storm flows get so high, you can see how high the storm flow might, can become scouring out, uh, scouring the, the banks and rendering them um, very um, fragile. We have a lot of undercutting of trees. Last winter, we lost um, a few really humongous trees in Cougar Canyon due to undercutting by stormwater flow. And of course, there's a direct flooding risk as well. I don't know if you have any spots like this in, um, in the Tri-Cities, uh, but um, Certainly along Lower Creek, we have several spots, and this is indeed a heron on the railroad track. But then what happens? Well, I set all that water into the pipes down the creeks out to the ocean, hasn't had a chance to soak into the ground, replenish the groundwater. And so then, whoa, where is our supply for the thirsty creeks and trees that are depending on that water in the summer when there is no rain? Um, we don't have a snowpack. Um, I don't know, does Coquitlam have anything of a snowpack? Anyone just shout that out? Do you have a bit of a snowpack over there? No one shouting it out. Okay, I'll, just, I'll assume you don't. So we don't have melting snow through the summer to keep our creeks flowing, say, uh, flowing cool and clean for salmon. It depends entirely on whatever rainwater we got into the ground um, that is coming seeping out into the creek through the dry season. So this is Cougar Canyon, a typical um, summer view of Cougar Creek in Cougar Canyon because we're not getting enough um, infiltration. And this is a tough one for coho salmon. We have a co wild coho run and uh, they need to be there year round in the creek. Summers are not great. Uh, I took this photo in Coquitlam trees, the urban forest, the urban for people aren't going around watering all of these trees, the urban forest too depends on all of this seepage. It's not enough to just save trees as if they're pieces of furniture, they need also the infiltration of the water, of rainwater. So you frequently see this kind of set up summertime, trees are stressed in parking lots, and yet if it does rain, 
all the water on the parking lot goes down the drain, except whatever falls on the tree islands. And uh, I didn't notice this yet in Port in Coquitlam, uh, but here in North Delta, we're seeing a lot of dieback of cedars now. You have twice as much rain as we do, so um, more chance that your cedars are going to be able to withstand some of the climate changes. So that's the water quantity picture, but then there's all uh, water quantity picture, but then there's also the quality picture. And that is that uh, water flowing down storm drains is carrying all kinds of pollutants. It's um, estimated that, that plastic from storm drains uh, might represent as much as 80% of the plastics in the ocean. It's little stuff, but multiplied zillions of times. Not as dramatic as say fishing gear, but nonetheless, hugely important. Cigarette butts, the filters are made of plastic, cellulose acetate oil and grease, uh, not to mention all the, the toxins in the tobacco, uh, oil and grease from cars and even from the blacktop itself, which is oily when it's new, sediments from construction, soap suds. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else saw this in the newspaper not too long ago, but um, a, um, a strata decided their roofs needed washing and the, the contractor uh, washed them with soap and ended up in the nearby creek. Tire and brake dust, you may have been following the issue of 6PPD, uh, which is a rubber um, uh, preservative used in tires. And when it gets out into the environment in the form of tire dust, as our tires are wearing out, it becomes 6PPD quinone, highly toxic to coho um, at all stages of life, but it does cause pre-spawn mortality in coho. We haven't seen pre-spawn mortality to any great degree in um, Delta, but in Burn Creek in Burnaby, they have an issue with that and they have a lot of heavy traffic around them. So all that yucky stuff is flowing along with the water into the underground pipes that empty right into the creeks. And uh, to summarize the situation that we have, all these impervious paved areas and roofs, polluting lots, uh, producing lots of polluted runoff, flowing too fast down drains into creeks, causes waste of rainwater, flashiness, too much or too little water in the creeks, pollution, destruction of salmon spawning and rearing habitat. And as we know, with heavier rains in the winter and longer dry spells in the summer uh, associated with climate change, these problems are just gonna get worse. So instead of piping away all of this runoff, how about if we rearrange the built landscape so that every paved roof um, or every paved area or roof drains into an area full of soil and plants or to look at it another way, how about looking at each and every area of soil and plants that we have and saying, hmm, is there some way I can water this area with a source from an impervious surface? So that's what a rain garden is. It's a garden that receives not just the rainwater that's falling onto it from the sky, but also rainwater runoff that's um, flowing into it from a pavement or a roof. And here's a bunch of pictures of rain gardens. If you can imagine the street where this picture is taken from extends kind of up a gradual hill. So runoff coming down the hill enters this rain garden through these two um, curb cuts. This scene might be familiar to you. Uh, Lougheed Highway, not far from Ikea. And we've got these, again, curb cuts with the metal plate over top to keep cars from uh, driving in by accident. So that's a great way of doing it at Peace Arch border crossing. If you pull in as you're heading south, if you pull in on the Canadian side, you might notice this setup here and also permeable paving. Um, Mountain Equipment Co-op on the North Shore, great system for getting roof water across the um, um, perimeter path around the building and into perimeter landscaping. South Surrey Rec Center, something a little artistic. Take that roof water and make a feature of it. Quite a dramatic waterfall when, when it's raining hard. 
Oops. And here's a uh, version in uh, Port Coquitlam. This is um, the newish rain garden in Lyons Park. And they did a great job of figuring out the, I call it downspout gymnastics, figuring out how to get the downspouts from the far side of the building to the front side of the building. And they did this at the other end of the building as well. Um, they've used a rain barrel as the intermediary and then um, a trench drain to take the water into this rain garden here. It doesn't look like much, but that's 120,000 liters of roof runoff per year from this roof at your rates of rain over there. In um, Surrey, in South Surrey, uh, neighbors got together and um, insisted that this kind of ugly detention pond uh, be turned into something really beautiful. They put in all the sweat equity on this and named it the Spirit Garden. So it's a stormwater detention pond, but now it's a community amenity. It's a place to walk your dog, sit, sit on a bench and enjoy yourself. And Coquitlam uh, has some of these ponds. Um, I was not able to look at them to see how the water gets into them, but this one is a Fife, Fifeshire Street water quality pond. So the idea of being a neighborhood pond, rather than doing it on individual property, you do the neighborhood. Nanaimo Hawthorne subdivision, this is another technique. Um, skip the curb, just have a concrete strip along the edge of the pavement and let the water um, sheet flow into your rain gardens, which gives a more even distribution of water. So to uh, kind of summarize this, um, rain gardens act like miniature forests and wetlands. They soak up runoff. And by doing that, they're replenishing the groundwater, reducing the summer drought stress on trees and creeks and salmon. The most rain garden, all rain gardens should have a safe overflow route. And often you'll see these raised drains um, to allow the water to pool a bit. Pooling water in a rain garden is a good thing. It doesn't mean the rain garden isn't working. It means the rain garden it is working, it's doing a good job. You want that water to pool for a while before soaking into the ground. This particular garden is a native plant rain garden or almost entirely native plant rain garden. And um, native plants are great in rain gardens, but it doesn't have to be limited to native plants. It can be whatever the traffic will bear where you're installing a rain garden. Um, rain gardens take the pressure off our pipes, our storm sewers and our creeks, so that's reducing costly flooding, erosion, need to replace sewers, fish habitat destruction, um, and so on. These uh, rain gardens have a great capacity for uh, removing pollutants, and I'm amazed, continuously amazed, how well gardens thrive. The garden ecosystems are great, despite the pollutants that come into them. Um, they just are very, very resilient. Rain gardens can be used to beautify ugly spaces. And here you see the before and the after and the curb cut where water comes in. They're also, uh, these are really multi-purpose landscapes, rain gardens in cities, because you're also getting a kind of pocket park when you put in a rain garden. It might be a very tiny pocket, or it could be kind of a nice size pocket like this one, Brook Elementary School rain garden, and all the benefits of any little pocket park with the fresh air and the habitat and the CO2 storage and the shade and the evapotranspiration. And finally, rain gardens are a great opportunity to put up some interpretive signage and uh, let people know what we can do to conserve water, protect our streams and oceans and help salmon. So often we think of what's happening with salmon as having to do only with the water in the creek or the water in the ocean. But in fact, it involves all of us because water links all of us to our salmon. So that was part one. And would you, are there comments, questions? Has everyone fallen asleep, gone home? Uh, oh, you are home. Hi, Deborah. Uh, hi. Any uh, comments? Uh, yes. Uh, Deborah, hi. Yes. I'm Judy. I live in um, Port Moody. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say that this is really interesting and important. 
And also um, for people who uh, are on their environment committees in the municipalities, uh, one thing that we've been uh, encouraging in Port Moody is uh, we have a we have what's called a sustainability report card. So this has different pillars like economic, cultural, environmental, and new developments are judged on how the how the development proposals rank with a list of criteria that the city provides. So I was just looking at ours quickly and they get points here in the city, the new, all the new developments for engineered green infrastructure solutions. And those include rainwater harvesting systems that support street trees, roof downsprout disconnection to green infrastructure, uh, water absorbent structures, uh, absorbent landscaping, no increase in Per in, in impervious surfaces. So there's quite a few of them here, including soil cells and, and bioswales and rain gardens. And I can see uh, since the sustainability report card started <clears throat> and it's been updated. And as these development proposals come before the city, the, uh, the, the developers uh, fill out the sustainability report cards and then they're submitted to the council and anybody can view them. So you get a good idea of where these development proposals are coming from by looking at uh, the, how, they've, how they've filled out uh, the, these different pillars in the sustainability report card. So at least in Port Moody, there certainly is an emphasis on, on these issues and, um, and, and the developers are, are, um, are encouraged uh, you know, to inc to incorporate all of these in their new development proposals. That's great. I could see that there's lots of activity over there, just looking on the web and uh, reading up on things. I think that um, uh, Burke Mountain Naturalists and any naturalist or stream keeper group also needs to kind of um, hold them to, to account on this because a Delta has a similar thing, but development is proving to be the toughest nut to crack. That is, um, the developers don't have to meet a particular score. I mean, it's a series of brownie points or gold stars or whatever, but it's not like um, they must do things. They're, they're, it's desirable, but so we see so many developments where they miss opportunities to do infiltration. They cut down every tree, so and they're you know they're allowed to, and then there's so much more throughput of water. So um, it's great that that's written there and through the um, Environment and Sustainability Citizens Advisory Committee or through letters or whatever. Hold them to account. <laughs> that that would be my my um my advice i mean every city has a lot of good statements like this but when it comes down to development it's sometimes tough that said um before i even gotten got involved in rain gardens i went to westwood plateau in 2002 maybe it was and an engineer named don moore who had worked for delta and um at that time then worked for west build was showing off a beautiful little rain garden right near the West Build offices in one of the early developments at Westwood Plateau. So I'm prepared to believe that you're more developed over there in this in this respect than we are. Another thing to watch for is um, often you'll hear them say um, that this development will not um, release any more um, water or at a higher any higher rate than pre-development in delta they say that often what it means is they're not overtaxing the storm sewer at any higher rate that is the flow per minute uh, but they could in fact be sending far 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 more water away for example if a single family house is replaced with an apartment building um, or a bunch of condos or whatever, they might have just a detention tank, a big sump that simply holds on to the water for a long period of time, but it's still releasing it into the pipe system just very slowly. Um, 
So, so yeah, read between the lines, I would, I would say, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm really glad to know that they've got so much detail in their uh, program there. Uh, Lori has her hand up. Hi, Deborah. Um, Hi, Lori. I, I live in Coquitlam. And uh, I just wondered if you could comment on alternatives to pavement, like in sidewalks and driveways? Yeah, you know, um, actually, thank you for asking that because it reminded me of something else too, uh, the whole issue of engineered solutions. Um, what I found, uh, certainly alternatives to pavement, gravel works great in um, uh, various applications, the uh, pavers work great. But the amount of preparation that goes into those um, permeable pav pavers and also permeable blacktop is enormous. The amount of, um, of, of um, um, you know, prep work underneath the pavement, I mean, they probably have to mine an entire river of gravel <laughs> just to make the, the underpinnings of the permeable pavement. So uh, in general, my preference is for not engineered solutions, but truly green solutions, passive green solutions that simply work by gravity and that don't involve really costly um, installations. That said, I mean, certainly <laughs> permeable pavers, especially on your garden path or, or your driveway or whatever, I mean, it's certainly better than, than, than the alternative. But I think the truest, greenest solution is we leave enough green space to absorb the water. And that could be on the property base, on a property basis, it could be the boulevards on our streets, or it could be on a neighborhood basis. But um, using that water with the minimum of engineering. I don't know if I've, the, the other, oh, one last comment too, is that um, I've noticed over the years that um, these um, supposedly permeable pavements, can tend to lose their permeability, but also the next owner of the property doesn't necessarily know what it's all about, sees a bunch of cracked bricks and decides to pave it with the cheapest thing, you know, blacktop or concrete. So it's something that's more easily undone. Whereas, for example, if we were required to have 15% treed space receiving rainwater runoff on each and every development, uh, you can't lie. That is the um, satellite photos show if you have that tree canopy or not. So that, that's my, my personal predilection is for transparent solutions that simply feed our runoff into green spaces and that they provide the most, you know, multiple benefits when you have the green space. Yes, I really like the idea of bringing back boulevards because that's something that you look in the old in the old areas of Vancouver. They've got nice boulevards with big trees, and that's something a lot of our new developments don't have. Don't have, yeah. And yeah, I I'm think thinking King, for, King Edward uh, Boulevard. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful boulevard! They don't take advantage of putting rainwater into it, but they could, or it can be boulevard. Although now it has SkyTrain under it, or Okay, Canada thank you, Shall I move along? Sure, that would be great. Yeah, okay. So um, this is how our collaboration in North Delta began. And we were very fortunate um, that there was an engineer who was the um, manager of utilities, Hugh Fraser, who was interested in this kind of thing. The stream keepers, my husband and I joined in 2004 um, after seeing some illegal tree cutting and getting involved in a restoration project and so on. And during that restoration project, we saw Cougar Creek go from like six inches deep to six feet deep. Um, it, in a matter of uh, half an hour of rain starting. So, you know, that really clinched it. Like I understood, <laughs> beware the killer pavement and um, the importance of infiltrating the rainwater rather than pouring it into our creeks. So um, uh, it was Hugh Fraser himself um, who actually suggested our first site. 
we approached the engineering department, asked if we could collaborate on a rain garden, and he suggested a site at an elementary school. We had no intention of working with kids, <laughs> but <laughs> um, there we were. We were on a site with a bunch of kids. And so we ended up uh, doing, um, doing a rain garden at a school. And thank you, Diane Ramage, for walking me through a PSF community salmon uh, program uh, funding application. I never could have done it on my own. And uh, we got some funds for that. So this was the site. And the idea was close off the storm drains in the parking lot, make curb cuts um, in this solid curb, and create a garden down here slightly lower than the, than the um, parking lot. So everybody seemed to be on board. We got this Pacific Salmon Foundation grant, thanks to Diane. Um, I think it was a leap of faith on everyone's part because we've never done this and I don't know if they'd ever funded a rain garden before. Uh, Delta did the excavation, the earthwork, the drainage modifications. Uh, planted the big trees, Stream of Dreams Society, Joan Carn, some of you might know her, uh, came and explained to every class why their rain garden was important, what it would do. Um, and then at that point, we unleashed our secret weapon, child labor. And as I say, we had no intention of working with kids, but they were there. They were a captive audience. So why not? So every kid in the school had a role to play in this rain garden. And um, it just proved to be the best thing that ever happened because you had a lot of engagement by the kids, by their parents, by their grandparents, by the community, the teachers. Oh, and here you can see the wheel stops. These are wheel stops and water can now flow off the parking lot and into this rain garden. And it evolved over time. Um, and we let these gardens evolve. We don't freeze them in time in some you know, vision of how it's supposed to be. We let them evolve as, as the plants grow larger, create more shade, create their own ecosystem and so on. So it was a big success and um, council thought, well, that's cool. Uh, we're getting um, good feedback from the public on this. Let's do it at every school. So uh, that's what happened. Every elementary school got a rain garden. Here's the smallest one. This is Mayor Jackson, our former mayor. She was a great supporter of the rain gardens. So here's the smallest rain garden in this teeny tiny little parking spot. And the idea was to reuse this as the safety overflow drain, which saves you a lot of money. So there it is. And the designer, Sarah Howie, who's um, a doctorate in, in burnt in bogs and manages the research in burns bog she designed this very clever system with two intakes and a kind of snail shell pattern of uh, water flow uh, to maximize the contact between the water and the soil and that's something that you will often um, see um, uh, could be better used in other rain gardens. You, you'll often see that um, rain gardens have a straight channel that goes straight to the drain, which is not the point. You want the maximum contact of water with soil. And here's the garden as it grew and the garden performing in winter. Here's the largest garden. And uh, this was shortly after planting in very heavy rains. This is a humongous one. The idea was our school roofs, all of our school roofs are sending oodles of water down, down drains and into creeks causing erosion, all the problems that we saw. And in this case, the roof was sending water into this green line here. If you go on your city's mapping system, the green lines are the, um, the storm sewers. And that green line was taking the water into Blake Creek. And meanwhile, we had this humongous uh, hydro corridor right next to the school. So the idea was let's engage hydro and took two years, but we finally got them engaged to put a rain garden there. And here's the route that the rain um, water runoff from the school roof was following this long, long, long route through this green pipe into Blake Creek where it could then cause its damage. Uh, and that's about two and a half million liters of water per year, which is just half of that school roof. The other half drains to a different, in a different direction um, 
So we couldn't trap that part. But here's our space. Here's the um, diversion pipe. And this pipe here has been closed off, but if need be, it could be opened uh, so that some water would go this direction and some in this direction. Here's the pipe entering the garden um, before it was planted. It's almost a football field long. Planting was a huge deal uh, with the city gardeners and, and stream keepers and kids. The kids loved having the city gardeners there, having guys around. Um, showing them the ropes. Big kids planted big plants and then little kids um, plant the little plants. Big kids do the mulching with big buckets of, um, these are from secondary school. We always mulch with wood chips. Little kids mulch with the empty pots and they are so efficient. A, a classroom of little kids, kindergarten through grade two or three, well, any, any age, really. They're like an army of ants. They're great at spreading that wood chip mulch that keeps the garden. We never water these gardens, so that the mulch is what maintains the moisture in the soil. And here you see the garden growing. I'll flip through these. I know this slideshow is very long, so I don't want to belabor things too much, but you can see the garden through the seasons and through the years. And a lot of pollinator plants in this garden. We weren't supposed to plant any trees because it is a hydro corridor. So and they didn't want anything tall that wasn't already pre-existing, that is. So between those two gardens, the tiny Richardson, the enormous McCloskey Hydro, there have been all kinds of sizes and shapes in between. Uh, you might wonder, why does a park need a rain garden? Isn't a park, um, you know, naturally just absorbing everything? Well, in this case, um, it, this was a wet area of lawn um, that was here prior to the rain garden. We're looking at it from the opposite direction here in this inset. And it had a storm drain at the top and a storm drain at the bottom to take away the natural seepage because it was a nuisance for lawn mowing. Well, if you have a lot of water, it's a gift. It's not a nuisance. The lawn is what should go, not the water. So um, Delta fortunately did agree. They dug up the lawn and we planted a garden that now benefits from this wonderful water supply that was there all along. So it's a matter of kind of thinking outside the box. Um, a school roundabout can be a nice location for a rain garden. There's a school driveway and the roundabout itself that feed into this one through these two curb cuts. Um, Northside Church rain garden was um, a, teens at the church who said, hey, we've helped you on your rain gardens in the summer. In the summer, they would come and volunteer with the stream keepers for a week and we'd have them doing school rain gardens. They said, can't we have a rain garden too? And it turned out that they had a great setup for a rain garden. Their entire parking lot drained into this storm drain, pre-existing storm drain, which could serve as an overflow. And uh, they had a car wash every summer. And now the soap suds, instead of going down that drain, go past the drain and sink into the garden, which is, that drain is right about here. So the garden is none the worse for wear for all that water. In fact, it's better off for all the water that it's getting. Pinewood Elementary School rain garden, a native plant rain garden. Great to have native plants, but they don't always work. Um, you have to be flexible. And here's Pinewood looking from the other direction. And um, I looked very intently at the cedar trees in, in um, Tri-Cities when I was over there the other day. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't have as much cedar tree stress as we do here in North Delta. We get about a thousand millimeters, so a meter deep of rain per year. You get almost 2000 over there, so almost two meters deep of rain. Uh, but here, cedar trees are dying right and left. And I think the only hope they have is where they are getting additional runoff water, in this case, from, from the uh, school driveway. It, a lot of it flows into this uh, particular rain garden. And the cedar tree on the edge of it, hopefully, is going to make it with that additional water supply. And there's camas. For those of you who are into native, um, native plants, the camas that was very common 
um, commonly used by the First Nations on Vancouver Island as part of the Gary Oak Camus um, um, ecological um, niche. Siakum Secondary School. Here, this storm drain from the roof of the uh, draining a major part of the school used to go straight down through the school building and into Delta's storm sewer and into Cougar Creek just across the street. And um, instead, now that water has been diverted. The school district plumber came and did a big diversion and the pipe comes into a trench that kids dug. The secondary students hand dug a trench that meanders throughout the entire garden. Some of these larger bits of vegetation at the back uh, were pre-existing, but for example, the Japanese maple is new. Um, so since 2016. And this photo was taken in July of 2020, was it 2021 or 2022? Sorry, I can't remember, but in the midst of summer, it was the heat dome summer, I'm losing track. And it, we never watered it. It did just fine on all the water that it had soaked up during the winter. And of course, with a full, um, cover, plant cover over all the soil and wood chips on anything that's not well planted, um, water doesn't evaporate much. Tidewater's rain garden, again, this was hideous. <laughs> uh, that this is what was here. And now we have this wonderful, again, native plant rain garden that takes all the roof runoff from Tidewater's pub and runoff from the parking lot. And in addition, the Alex Fraser Bridge is now feeding runoff into this rain garden. So no wonder the trees have grown so fast. Okay, that was our second part and just kind of um, a glimpse of different styles of rain garden that you can have. Any comments or questions before we move on to something that we can all do <laughs> at home? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just one quick question. How much maintenance do these uh, gardens take? Do you weed them on a regular basis or, uh, or, or it, things like that? Great question. I always say that rain gardens are a bit like kids. If you raise them well, then they become more and more self-maintaining as they, as they go. Maintenance is a big issue for cities. And I think that part of the reason is they, um, they're used to maintaining with they like to maintain with big equipment. Do you know what I mean? They want big mowers and they want automated this and power that and hedge pruners and so on. And that's not really the best way to raise a, a garden. So they require fairly close management when they're young. And that's, we have an adopt a rain garden program. Um, so citizens are adopting and citizens are more willing to do um, weeding, trimming, shaping, and so on. Um, and also willing to keep spreading wood chips over and over and over again. Wood chips are our secret weapon for maintenance. We get them free from arborists. Um, it's from pruning jobs. They chip everything. We don't, um, we don't want holly, but within reason, we'll take any kind of wood there is, even cedar. And it, not only does it um, maintain moisture in the soil, but it keeps the weeds down. As the gardens get older and their canopies, their plant canopies kind of close over all the soil, it gets to be less and less maintenance. Um, we've made some plant choice mistakes that I wouldn't make again. Uh, big thorny, um, large size berberus that you know require a lot of thinning and they're thorny. Um, kids can't work on them easily, for example. But um, if you choose your plants really well and you've got a pretty good handle on that, it becomes less and less maintenance over time. So I do think, though, too, that, um, you know, everyone's talking about green infrastructure and how, how we have to be doing more with green infrastructure and less with gray. Uh, but it takes a while for city maintenance people to catch up with the idea that that means, oh, Maybe we're going to have more people who know how to maintain green infrastructure and use fewer resources on, uh, on maintaining the gray infrastructure um, or perhaps just add to the green infrastructure because it has so without, without reducing the gray uh, because it has so many co-benefits for um, climate and mental health even um, these spaces. 
So, but yes, that's, did, did I kind of, I don't know if I spoke to what you were thinking about or. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. That was, that was great. Thank you. Are you a gardener yourself, Jeff? Uh, no, but my partner is a, a, a heavy vegetable gardener. Uh -huh. Yeah, and people often ask about planting veggie gardens um, as rain gardens. And um, if it's just roof runoff, I don't really see a problem with it um, unless you have some kind of, I don't know, toxic materials on your roof. But the water coming from your roof is probably no more polluted than the water, than the rain coming through the air and falling into your veggie garden with whatever air pollutants it brings along with it. Um, so we'll be um, looking a bit more at um, downspout gardens in the next section that you could do at home. Possibly your partner could even find a water source in that way. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. John. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for your presentation. One of the challenges that we always face when dealing with cities and looking at green infrastructure is a reluctance by particularly engineers. They always talk about liability issues and I'm sure you've heard this before. You no, know, they have a certain standard and they do not want to take any chances in terms of flooding by new and innovative methods. Uh, how do you counteract that? Oh, absolutely. You are so right on. How do you how do you come by your experience? I'm dealing directly with municipalities, both on a volunteer and consulting basis. And what have you been trying to do that they were dragging their heels on or saying, no, no, we can't do this? Well, one of the things that I tend to find that is very little known about, but there's a, a wonderful federal government program. Gibson's is the first in BC to adopt a recognizing green infrastructure as part of an asset within the municipality, which is a huge change that in many cases, some of these devices can work even more efficiently. And up until now, we haven't regarded them as having any value. But if you could put dollars and cents or reduce maintenance and show that the liability is not as great an issue. And the more examples we can point to, the better off we are, but it's an uphill battle. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Uh, uh, sounds like you've been following, I can't remember his name, the Brazilian or Portuguese fellow from Gibson's. Yes. Um, yeah, um, and also Kim Stevens. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You've hit the nail on the head. There are so many situations in which um, cities are, you know, they're so worried about liability. So where we would be somewhat more um, looking at the longer, longer term liability of putting all of our water into pipes that are going to be too small at some point. Uh, they're looking at the short-term immediate liability of, oh dear, what if I put this water into the landscape and it um, causes damage in some way. Yeah. So uh, um, I will address that a little bit in the next Certainly. section, just for rain gardens that you can do yourself. Uh, we've had to turn handsprings uh, sometimes, but um, the main thing is that our city anyway seems to be freaky about is nothing near a slope. They're very nervous about slopes. Um, and um, always having an, a safe overflow route, which totally, totally makes sense. And those two things combined, now it's difficult not to be near a slope when you're in Coquitlam. <laughs> I drove around, and, but I have an example coming up where I think um, we can see that it would be safe. So um, now you've really hit the nail on the head with cities. And mm -hmm. we've got pretty good traction so far now on uh, Boulevard Rain Gardens, that is where you make a curb cut into a grass boulevard and take street water off and into the grass boulevard. And you either put an overflow drain in that grass boulevard or you guide the water back out to the street. So we've had pretty good success with that. Um, we've had good success with rain gardens in um, parks, but um, rain gardens in developments, um, that's, that's been a tough nut to crack. Um, and yet Surrey does it all the time. They have a, a Surrey has been bucking the tide for 40 years. They've had um, their default is that your roof downspout from your house will be disconnected and will go into your garden. 
Um, so it can be done. So let's look at, oh, sorry, were there any other comments or questions? Okay, let's look at creating your own rain gardens. Some of the gardens that I showed it might look kind of intimidating and, and you know, we've got just this accidental advantage that uh, under Hugh Fraser, Delta started partnering with the stream keepers and, you know, one step led to another. And we had uh, collaboration from Civic Salmon Foundation, thanks to Diane Ramage and others. And so, um, you know, that was great. But on a small scale, there's a lot of stuff that we can all do. And as we all know, many, many small things can add up to quite a big thing. Uh, and also when you're dealing with smaller quantities of water, there's less that can go wrong. Um, so, and you're closer up to it. For example, a downspout at your house. So we'll look at that. Um, you might install a speed bump or a curb cut. Um, to deal with your driveway runoff. You might nature scape a ditch that's already pre-existing uh, to make that ditch more acceptable. Um, and if you're feeling ambitious, there's a bit more that you can do. So let's look at some of these options. So if you think these small projects won't have an impact, I'd like you to think again. Um, in Coquitlam, the annual precipitation is not quite 2,000 millimeters a year, which is two meters deep of water. It's a lot of water. Um, so how much rainwater falls on each square meter of surface in a year? Now, the answer is 2,000 liters of rainwater for every square meter of surface. But this gives an idea. In, in North Delta, we're looking at 1,000 liters. Um, you're looking at 2,000 liters for every square meter of surface. So you have to be a little more cautious over there, for sure, uh, about the amount of water that you are going to divert into um, your landscaping. Either divert less or make your landscaping, your receiving landscaping bigger to be safe. So, uh, but looking at the volumes of water there that are involved, this happens to be our house. And in fact, we only get about a thousand millimeters of rain per year. But if our house were over there in your neck of the woods at 2000 millimeters of rain per year, how many liters would fall on this relatively modest suburban roof? Well, it works out to 470,000 liters per year. Now, in actual fact, here in North Delta, we're just getting 235,000 liters per year, but we have disconnected all of our downspouts and we're putting all that water into our landscaping. So more caution required up in the Tri-Cities, but certainly it can be done. And these are our downspouts and these are where some of them are going. So gee, it's a great resource for gardens and also for replenishing that groundwater that keeps the salmon streams flowing through the summer. So let's disconnect the roof downspout. And what we're gonna do is guide it away from our underground perimeter drainage and put it into existing plantings, which makes it pretty easy. So here we have a planter box that has a tree and some shrubs and a bit of a pathway. This was during quite a heavy rain. And of course it's draining just a portion of the roof. If you walk around your house, go outside, walk around your house or your condo complex or whatever, and you'll see that the rain is divvied up among many different um, areas. So that's how you can safely take one portion and send it into, into your garden. You see this done, this is in Surrey, as I mentioned in Surrey, they do this as a default. Um, they get about as much rain as we do. So again, not as much as in the Tri-Cities, but you'll frequently see this arrangement here. Oops. Um, this is a get back to our house. And I'm sorry, that is ivy. I, we didn't know what we were doing, forgive us. <laughs> that was planted, you know, 30 years ago, um, these extenders that are accordion pleated, you can aim them wherever you want them to go. So um, one of our six downspouts uh, goes into this area. 
Uh, we have a rain barrel with an overflow going under a path into a treed area with ferns. Um, another rain barrel with a nice tripping hazard across a path into rhodos. The rule though is safety first before you disconnect your downspouts. So you don't wanna do this on or close to a steep slope. And that's where that development that's climbing up Burke Mountain um, becomes a little bit dicey. You wanna be sure that you're in a safe space. And I will show you an example where I think you would be. Um, make sure that if there's excess water, um, it's gonna have a safe place to go, maybe out into the street and down a storm drain. Make sure you've got a decent, um, a reasonable ratio of roof area to the receiving garden area. So out here in North Delta, five to one is very conservative. We have many rain gardens that are up in the range of 12, 13, 15 to one. But if you wanna to be totally safe in a place like Coquitlam, I would suggest three to one. In other words, three parts roof to one part garden or three parts driveway to one part garden. And you want to protect against soil erosion. Just watch how the water behaves and then use whatever you need to use, a splash pad, some rocks and gravel or whatever to prevent, prevent erosion. The larger and more established your plants, the safer and higher performing the rainwater infiltration. All of our rain gardens at the schools and, and community locations in North Delta have improved. Some that used to overflow down their safety overflow drains no longer do, uh, or only in the heaviest, heaviest rains. So here's an example of a safe situation. It just happens to be a little modest uh, bungalow, but we've got a downspout. We've got a large area. I'm standing on the street. There was no sidewalk here. There's a lot of mature shrubs here. And where will the excess go? To the street gutter and down the nearest storm drain where it would have ended up anyway. So it's not a risk. There was no sidewalk in this situation, not a risk. You can add more plants to increase the absorption rates. For example, in here where the lawn is not growing very well anyway, add some more shrubs. Here's another safe situation. We have a gentle slope out to the street. There is a sidewalk, uh, but there are two trees that are gonna suck up that water really nicely. If you feel that water might be a little bit too close to your house, you can extend your downspout farther away. This, um, this house here on the right happens to back onto a natural area and it's not a particularly steep one, so that's great. <laughs> this is a hinged um, uh, downspout. So, uh, and it's going into a thirsty cedar hedge. You may have noticed, well, maybe not over your way, but out here in North Delta, cedars are dying right and left, including cedar hedges. And um, so this cedar hedge is no doubt benefiting from this extra water and if they need to get a wheelbarrow past or whatever, just swing up the hinged downspout and bring in their wheelbarrow or their load of dirt or whatever. Uh, the slinky effect, if anyone remembers playing with slinkies, just to get the water into a safe place where it's not gonna cause any problem. And uh, here we have a cedar tree in, in uh, Surrey beginning to show signs of drought stress. And we have a downspout here anchored into the ground. How about getting that downspout over this away beyond the stairs so that um, that water will be helping the tree So one trick you can always use, run a hose 20 minutes, 30 minutes longer if you're concerned, see where that water goes, run the hose uh, where your downspout, where you want to empty your downspout and uh, check it out. We had some puddling, but not a great deal. And uh, if this stone hadn't been here, this puddling would have moved itself over here. So, hey, remove the damaged edging stone guide the rainwater there to where it's needed, and you've got a cedar tree that's more likely to survive climate change. You can also install a speed bump on your uh, driveway. Um, in this case, um, the water is kind of 
sheet flowing down the driveway, just a little speed bump is guiding it into a gravel parking strip where it can infiltrate rather than heading down a drain in the street. Here's another speed bump. Uh, Delta installed this one to guide rainwater into um, a, a, a ditch, and it happens to be our landscaped ditch. Uh, landscaped is too big a word, our planted dish. <laughs> and you can see here skunk cabbage, some maiden hair ferns, and so on. You can create a curb cut. Now here, uh, the first example, um, this is more likely something that you would see at a school, and indeed this is at a school. Uh, they created a curb cut and they guided all the water here. And uh, getting rid of the lawn was great because you know, you've got a captive audience of secondary students who've got tons of energy, PE class or environmental class. So doing a curb cut to uh, and uh, here's another curb, just to show you the difference in how plants grow. Here's a curb cut that Delta did in a, in a curb bulge. Look at this tree. This is a meta sequoia, the dawn redwood. And look at this one and look at this one. This one is thriving from that additional water that it's getting. And we see this over and over and over again with rain gardens, that a tree that's near the rain garden intake just becomes you know, its full self and able to cool us with its evapotranspiration. You could nature-scape a ditch, and that's in fact how my husband and I began doing this uh, in about 2002. You don't wanna block the flow, but you just wanna slow the flow. The ditch is already much more environmentally friendly than a pipe in the ground. When you think of the size of a drainage pipe and you think of the size of a ditch, a ditch has a lot more capacity. It may not be suitable on a busy street, but if you live on a quiet street, it can be just a great resource and its habitat as well. So of course you have to check with your government's engineering department, make sure that they don't have plans for that. But this was the ditch outside our neighbor's house and contiguous with our ditch. So over time, we, um, yeah, we planted up the whole thing. It's wonderful. There are people in the neighborhood who particularly walk their dogs down this way just to see how the ditch is doing because it's like a little creek in the neighborhood. And this is very much self-sustaining. Uh, there was a question about maintenance. Other than mowing the strip on the side here, I would say we do like three times we maintain this, kind of do a, a major cleanup in the year. Um, and otherwise let it do its thing. This is more views from that ditch. And because the ditches are almost invariably connected upstream and downstream to the city's piped system, they already have a safe overflow. You don't have to worry about safety. If you're working in a ditch, you've got your automatic intake and at the downhill end of the ditch, it goes into a place where the ditch got closed over. Uh, West Van, um, someone in West Van did a similar thing using native plants, sword ferns, and um, I can't remember now, can anyone tell, is that uh, Mahonia? I think it's Mahonia, maybe Salal as well. Um, someone in North Delta did a very, very imaginative little ditch scene. Another North Deltan, low maintenance ditch. This one has been around for years and years, and it, it always looks, to my eye, it looks wonderful. Um, did a recent one, um, uh, a wild and woolly North Delta ditch with lots of grasses that would grow very tall. So the owners agreed to uh, let the um, wild outside program, youth program, um, do a rain garden in their ditch. The city did not want us to do the outside edge. They want to maintain the ability to mow that. They're always fearful that um, something will happen and, you know, they will need access to the ditch. So no plantings on the outside edge, uh, but they, I don't know if you can see the plantings here. These kids did a wonderful job in two sessions of turning this into a, kind of a nature scape. So if you're feeling more ambitious, there's lots of advice out there. Um, and um, here comes um, Coquitlam's Environmental Sustainability Plan. Manage stormwater to mimic the natural hydrology of the watershed and reduce pollution while incorporating the anticipated impacts of climate change, which means wetter winters and drier summers. So, you know, they've, they've asked us to 
mimic the natural hydrology and under that rubric, uh, action 103, explore ways to increase on-site rain and stormwater retention. Well, it's an invitation to approach the city and say, you know, hey, can you help me do this? So when I was in Coquitlam, I had a look at Pine Tree Elementary School and true, it's up a hill and you have to be cautious near steep slopes, but it has a vast, well, not that vast. It has a medium sized parking lot uh, with a solid curb that prevents that parking lot water from accessing this barren slope of grass with one tree on it. To my eye, this is a perfect place for a community rain garden. Here's your uh, storm drain here. You don't even need to close it off. Just leave it there, but make curb cuts here into this area here. Make um, This would be a bigger job than just letting the water go. You want to plant things. You want to make a channel for the water to meander, traverse the slope, perhaps. But there are options and there are opportunities in many places everywhere we look. So if you'd like to explore it further, here are some places you can look. Um, Washington State is really advanced with their rain gardens. They're a great inspiration. And you'll have access to this um, program, so, so you can look these up if you're interested. Um, they have their RainWise um, program of um, um, advice sheets that you can look into. You can find all these on online. Soils for Salmon gives lots of advice. 12,000 Rain Gardens in Puget Sound is not the government down there, but a, a, a citizen organization. Um, here are a couple of lists that might uh, help you. Um, if you decide you'd like to do a rain garden, steps that you can take to um, uh, make it happen. And um, also common mistakes, common problems that happen and how to avoid those. So regardless of the details, the fundamentals are always the same. And I always encourage people not to get too caught up in the details. The fundamentals are water flows downhill. It doesn't flow uphill, it flows downhill. Plants and soil intercept the water and they sponge it up. That's what they've always done. They have a great capacity for doing that. We wanna take advantage of that in order to provide cleaner water supply, seepage water supply for our salmon streams. The more and bigger the plants, the more water a rain garden can intercept. If you've got a rain garden that's actually a forest, you can truly mimic what was here before we started building all our imper uh, impervious surfaces, uh, which are part of why we see the big decline in salmon because these surfaces produce polluted water and too much wa dirty water at once and not enough water at other times. So the more and bigger the plants, the closer you can resemble a forest, the better it is. It's that simple. And this is one of my favorite rain garden maintenance crews from a few years ago. They're at a church. So the youth group did maintenance of their garden, which was fun. The end. Thanks very much, Deborah. Stop the share here. I, that would be perfect. Now, I didn't look at the clock. I'm noted for going over time. So we are on home. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> That's okay. Pretty much everybody is stuck around, so that's great. Okay. Uh, but um, maybe what we won't. You've you've given us a lot of information, and people can always go back to the recording and and uh, pause for some of that that information. So um, so maybe what we could do is we'll we'll go to our uh, wildlife sightings, and if if you don't mind sticking around, if if people want to stick around a little bit late and and ask some questions, they could do that. Just to say thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Absolutely super, Deborah. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Yeah, and lots, lots of compliments in the in the chat as well. You've got us all thinking now what we can do. Find our own little garden somewhere <laughs> where we can do good. Yeah, these days it's so frustrating looking at the big picture, but 
in fact, the big picture is the sum of so many little pictures that we can sometimes fix. Right. Yeah. And water is always something fun to work with. So, uh, so Brian, do you want to screen share and do the wildlife settings? So I'm not hearing from Brian. I'm not sure if he stepped away or not, but um, maybe is there anybody out there that had some wildlife sightings that they'd like to share? Uh, we had the otter back at Blackburn Lagoons uh, last week. Good. Had they been away uh, for a while? Well, they're not there all the time. Um, okay. But this this was just a single one uh, enjoying a snack on uh, a fairly large fish. May I ask where Blackburn Blackburn uh, lagoons? Uh, Bla right. Blakeburn. 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 It's um, it's it's off of um, Louis Highway near Costco and the Pitt River Bridge. That ge general area, a little north of there. Uh, Ian, um, yep. I, I would. It's this is a curiosity more than anything. I was in North Burnaby, uh, at the very north of Burnaby on Boundary Road, and I swear I saw a um, northern shrike, which I thought was really out of place there. But I would be curious to see if anybody else could comment on whether that was as curious as I thought it was. Well, we do have Larry on the line if if he's willing to comment or any information. Well, they can be any place at this time of the year. That they, if if there's something, if there's prey that they're after, they can be there. Thank you. And if anybody wants to see trumpeter swans, drive along the highway to Chilliwack. But be a be a passenger because they're lined up all along the highway in the fields, <laughs> and it's hard to keep your eyes on the road when you want to watch them. Mm. Look at the swans. We saw them with Andrew. Yeah. Anybody else with some sightings? I, I did hear on the um, on the news that there were cougars being spotted in people's backyards in Coquitlam, but I didn't hear where in Coquitlam that was. My my uh, thought to that was I, I'd be surprised if I heard someone say there weren't any cougars in Coquitlam. So yeah, they've been uh, up around Monday Park. In the oh, kind okay. of uh, Shines area a bit. Okay. Yeah. Just as an aside, I had a some some video clips from a friend up up north, and if you've ever seen uh, the the starlings doing their 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 big wave when they get in big concentrations, they have almost the same thing with Bohemian waxwings up in Prince oh. George at the moment. Wow! Wow! It is it is it's quite a spe spectacle. Yeah. Muration, I think it's called. It's 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 amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. yeah. Like when you look at it, you think, well, that, that must be all starlings. But no, right. she said there were, there was. She figured there was five thousand plus. Wow. Bohemian oh, wow. In that flock. Wow. Right. Goodness. And Laurie, have you got your hand up? Yeah, there's uh, been a Townsend solitaire still hanging around. We've seen it occasionally over the winter and. I had never noticed that other years. I don't know if that's common or not. There, we saw it within the last week again. There's quite a few in the area at the moment. I'm trying to find one of them, Pitt Meadows, but. Brian's never... waving his hands Br around. Br Br Brian's back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, we can't, we can't hear you. And I don't see that you got your mic off, but um, we're not hearing you, Brian. Oh, mic's off, mic's on. <laughs> and then he disappeared. I think he's going to write a note to us. Okay. Uh, Brian has computer problems. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, Bri okay, Brian, can you screen share and not? Okay. Anybody a lip reader out there? <laughs> I 
And does Brian know semaphore? So Brian, are, um, put your put a thumbs up if you're able to screen share. Oh, there we go. Boy, that was quick. Yeah, maybe you can jump in and, and uh, talk about your photos. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was just walking along the Coquitlam River a week or two ago, and um, there was these um, falsely the valley berries. Um, uh, so if you can click through them, Brian. Um, and so, so those are the, the the berries, and then these are the seeds. So the um, sort of the, the the shell of the the berries had, had rotted and just left the seeds on the um, on the leaves. Hmm. And, so that, and there, that that's that's uh, that's a berry with the seed inside that uh, sort of all the flesh had. Uh, gone and just left the, the shell and the seeds inside. Very interesting. So I'm keeping an eye on them, see if they uh, if they plant and and, uh, and grow into new uh, off lily of the valleys. Victoria thinks it's interesting. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go look at mine tomorrow. Really interesting. Oh, well. If anybody wants any false lily of the valley seeds, I know exactly where to get them. Uh, and this is just or orange jelly fungus. Um, it, it, I, I, it looks sort of nice against the uh, the green moss there. And you can, there's a couple of bugs on there too, you can see. This is my uh, one of my shots. And oh, great, Larry. I learned something that, that I hadn't known for 30 plus years of birding. and. This is actually called a storm widgeon. I had sent it into eBird as a as a hybrid, and it come back to me that no, this is a a plumage variation of the of the American widgeon, and it can get the white can get even more intense on on the head. This is a, a fox sparrow with leucistic tendencies, obviously, that I had on on the dike. Uh, at the end of Ford, what's called Ford Landing and, and Pitt Meadows with and it and uh, right beside it was one in regular plumage. Hmm. And there that's the two of them side by side and one is the normal plumage and the other one with logistics. Yeah. This is uh, being an elusive bird for me, I finally caught up with it. It's a, a jeer falcon that's been hanging. We usually get jeer falcons out in pit meadows every year, almost without exceptions. This one is moves around the area so much that it took me well, all this so far this year to catch up to it. But thanks to Dave Schutz, uh, he gave me a call and said he's, he had it on one of the towers just uh, south of Corner Road, which is uh, up Ranny Road. And uh, he stuck around and uh, got a nice picture of it. This is the prairie falcon that uh, has been hanging around. It's actually been, comes back every year. I think this is maybe the sixth year, I could be wrong. And George Clulo, I'm sure a few people know him. Him and I were out on a walk uh, on January 26th. And uh, this is his favorite location along Connecting Road. Another bird I, tried many times to catch up to it. It was always there an hour before I got there or an hour after I got there. But finally, uh, we got it. This is a, when we were walking along the dike uh, between uh, Sharp Road and uh, Harris Road, George kept hearing, my hearing isn't what his is, so he kept hearing Western Meadowlarks. And I, I thought, well, I can't hear them, but I don't, I believe he's hearing them. Then all of a sudden I saw a few birds fly into a field and knowing what they look like, I said, yeah, those, George, we just, I just had the meadowlarks. And then <clears throat> about uh, 50 meters later, there was a tree full of them. I think it was 23. Wow. Okay. 
Wow, that's great. Thank you, everybody, for contributing to that. Or or at least Larry and, and Jeff. <laughs> and, and Brian's given us two thumbs up as well, so. I can't, I, I'm not sure what it was, so anyways. Okay, um, so thanks, Brian. And um, anybody else with some wildlife sightings? Or or if you had any questions uh, for Deborah. Okay, I'll, I'll make a comment. Oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> there were some questions in the chat. The okay. Sure. Interest. Sure. If you want to, uh, did you, do you want me to read them out or did you read them? Uh, no, there were just a few that I happened to notice. Okay. Uh, questions or comments. Um, so I see Victoria mentioned it would be nice to have a self-guided tour. And we do actually have a, a brochure um, that I can send you called um, I think it's called Visit North Delta's Rain Gardens or something like that. It's also available online. So it's simply a map and, um, you know, with addresses and numbers on the map and so on. So just to let you know that I will I'll provide that to Victoria. And oh. if anyone is over this way and wants to visit some rain gardens, and we're also always happy to arrange tours um, and uh, like individual tours we often have groups coming and walking around not all the gardens i mean 30 gardens you'd be too exhausted but but uh, there is a sent a uh, section of the north delta social heart um and then is it pronounced mica or mika mica mika m-i-k-a how how's that pronounced uh, i'm i'm not sure oh okay um anyway um was making a comment about um you know it would be great to catch runoff from roads and streets and um you know highways and in fact you see a lot more of this now like mm -hmm. we've got a brand new interchange at the south end of the alex fraser bridge and it's really been done in a very good way for sending runoff into um, ponds with uh, large woody debris and plantings and so on. So there's more and more this idea that this rainwater runoff is um, is a, a useful thing to have. And uh, we have quite a few streets now where the runoff is being put into the boulevard and then the boulevard is planted with something. So um, typically they don't excavate them quite as deep as they should, but at least it's an attempt to um, do something with roads and streets. And then someone commented too that the cedars are more stressed than I was thinking over there um, in the Tri-Cities. And so just a plea, if that's what you're noticing, um, do kind of drive around when you see what you think of as stressed cedars have a look and think, you know, gee, is, this a, is there a place where we could bring water to these cedars from the street, for example? Um, um, water that's otherwise just going to go down a drain. So those were some of the comments. And thank you very much for your positive comments in general. That was very kind of you. Great. Anybody with any other comments? I may have missed some. There were there were. Yeah, there's 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 a few in there, and some of them were just sharing information with other people as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I've got a, a, a another question. Um, how does this have any effect on Burns Bog, the work that you're doing, or or is it sort of more local? Yes. Um, it, okay. So Burns Bog is there's a um, a before highways were built, we had between North Delta and Burns Bog, we have Highway 91. So Highway 91 is kind of a big barrier between um, our community and the bog. But um, take away that highway and the foot of North Delta, which is on an escarpment, so the lower part of North Delta at the foot of the escarpment, which is a nature reserve, um, has always been kind of an intermixing zone of bog waters spreading out from the dome of Burns Bog towards that, that escarpment that North Delta is built on. And 
uh, nutrient rich water draining off the escarpment. So um, that is, it's always been this kind of mixing area there around the, um, at the foot of, I wish I had my map up, but I don't have it up anymore. Uh, in any event, um, it's always been kind of a mixed landscape and that's where our salmon stream runs. Uh, it runs right along the foot of the escarpment up to the Fraser River. So um, what was your comment again then about Burns Pond? Oh, oh I, I was just curious if, um, well, I guess the, the effect of the rain gardens are sort of, are very local, but uh, they presumably also have kind of a, a, a wider effect. Yeah, um, and um, because Burns Bog is a domed bog, meaning it's like higher in the center and then sloping down to the exterior, and part of the restoration of Burns Bog has been closing off the old ditches. They they had originally put in a lot of ditches to uh, facilitate the peat cutting, peat harvesting, and now those have been mostly closed off, dammed either by beavers or by peat starting with people, and then beavers took over, and so you can even see it from uh, satellite from space that the water has built up back again in the dome, the central dome of, of Burns Bog. So what we're doing on the edge of Burns Bog doesn't really affect the water in the bog because we're on the, the outer edge, the lag zone that was really where the where the dome was kind of, the dome of the bog was sort of petering out anyway, um, if that makes any sense to you. Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, thank you, that was great. From maybe Deborah can correct me. From what I could see from the map, uh, Cougar Creek was in, in between the two areas. So any water that was coming down from North Delta would get caught in uh, Cougar Creek and and go out to the Fraser rather than going towards Burns Bog. Exactly. That's exactly it. You've said it much more clearly than I did. <laughs> and in fact, historically, though, the water from uh, the North Delta escarpment. Um, at least half of it, the southern half of the North Delta escarpment, that water used to go out towards Boundary Bay. Uh, mm -hmm. it, in other words, it used to head south rather than north to the Fraser River. But, you know, they put in the railroad track. And then when they started building in North Delta, there was so much runoff that um, uh, it was endangering the railroad track um, and still does to some extent. So that's when they diverted the creek northward to the Fraser River. It took about 20 years to restore a salmon run there, which the old time stream keepers did um, because the salmon sort of lost their way. I mean, it's like, where's the creek? It's gone, you know, brand new route. Um, but that was about 40 years ago. So it's all settling in 50 years ago. So I, I was just going to make a comment about rain barrels. I have a, about six or so rain barrels myself and and I have a system of running the water into the rain barrels when it when it rains heavy, it um, you know it slows the water down, releasing into the rest of the yard, uh, which helps as well. But I find for myself during the winter, just because of freezing up and that, that I uh, disconnect my rain barrels and run the water straight into the um, into sort of the housing pipe system and out, out to the storm sewer, just because of the freezing and that. So. Uh, you know, I think that's a really good example of how you just need to observe your own setting and decide what works for, for you and for your setting, what's safe for you, what's safe in one place might not be safe in another place. So it does get us out there and observing, watching how water behaves and figuring out how we can make the best use of it. It sounds, you know, excellent what you've done. Yeah. And especially given the amounts of water that you get over there. That we get enough for water during the winter that I don't have to worry so much about you know watering the yard. So yeah, I'm sorry to hear that the cedars, in fact, are more stressed than I thought. I mean, a lot of them looked really good, but uh, apparently you're feeling the effects of that too, even with your greater rainfall over there. The, I guess the, dry, the long the, summer drought is what it, it is. It is. It is. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? We we are getting the numbers are going down here so so it was thank thank you again so much Deborah. that was that was fabulous really uh opened up um i think when people drive around now or walk in their neighborhoods they can 
they can see what other people have done, maybe on a smaller scale or a larger scale. So that's that's really interesting. Yeah, and perhaps your municipalities have done a lot, but it's rather hidden. I'm a big fan of what you can see doing rain gardens where you can see how it's working. It's not some highly engineered thing underground that we don't really know what's happening, but it's really educating us as to where our water is going. I mean, no water, no life, right? So um, yeah, yeah, do look around at your landscapes and pressure your cities to make more rain gardens that are above ground and you can appreciate them um, as, they're, as they're working right in front of your eyes. Thank you okay. very much for having me. Yeah, great. Thank you. So a um, oh, little hand clap there for some people. And um, yeah, just a reminder that we have a bunch of things coming up. Uh, check out the, the website. There's lots of information on there as well as a newsletter. And um, and just a reminder that our, our next month meeting uh, will be, in lieu of that, we'll have the Tri-Cities Urban Forest Forum at Douglas College, and that will be on March 7th. So once again, thanks, thanks everybody. Um, have a safe trip to your couch tonight or to bed, wherever you're heading. And um, and if any of the executive want to stick around and have a short chat, they can. Otherwise, um, good night, everybody. <laughs>